Hello, everyone. This is Cherie Ariano live with the Ascension Sessions. It is Thursday, September 30th, and I'm so excited to be here with you. I have a great show lined up for you, and I can't wait to get into it. But I just wanted to say thank you, everyone, for being here. Hello, Dragon Rose. Thank you so much for being here. Um, because I don't have a moderator, I would love it if you guys could put your questions in all caps if you're watching on um, either YouTube or Facebook. And I will be monitoring the chat room and be able to, you know, pass along any of your questions to Maureen, um, who's our guest, as I just spilled the beans, but you probably already knew that anyways. <laughs> so if you're new to my channel, please go ahead and subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. Um, I appreciate you all being here so much. I know you have a lot of choices of where you could be tonight and what content you could be absorbing. So I really appreciate you being here and sharing this time and space, space with myself and Maureen. So without further ado, I'm going to bring in our guest tonight, the lovely Maureen St. Germain. So just give me one second to bring her in. Hello, Maureen. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm trying to adjust my light so it's pretty uh, there. Maybe that's a little, maybe I just need to come in a little. You never know what you need to do until you have to do it. <laughs> okay. I'm going to read your bio, Maureen, for everybody who um, may be new to you. Uh, and that'll give you a second to go ahead and adjust your light. But you look great and you sound great. So Maureen St. Germain is an internationally acclaimed Ascension teacher and a best-selling and award-winning author. Her latest book, Beyond the Flower of Life, is a release, a re-release of her 2011 best-selling book. Maureen was granted access to a dimension that has been closed to most of humanity for eons and is a direct channel to source. She has developed foolproof techniques to access your higher self and teaches the power of sacred tools. She has taught in person in 24 countries and her books have been translated into 12 languages. Bestsellers include Opening the Akashic Records, named COBR or a Coalition of Visionary Resources, and the book of the year winner and waking up in 5D, which is right here, <laughs> named best-selling book of 2019. And I also have another one of her books right here called Reweaving the Fabric of Your Reality, which is in my personal toolkit. And Maureen has taught at the prestigious American Centers, Kripalu and the Omega Institute. She has been featured on National Geographic specials, Gaia TV, the Conscious Life Expo, and hundreds of radio shows worldwide, including Coast to Coast with George Norrie and Fade to Black with Jimmy Church and Midnight in the Desert with David Schrader. Welcome again, Maureen, to the show. It's so great to have you back on the show because it's been a few years. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I love what you're doing. I love um, everything about the fact that you've got this program going and that we can catch it all on the Telegram channel. That's really awesome. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, for everyone who um, wasn't aware, I do have a Telegram channel and I'll put it up on the screen right, screen right now so you can join. Um, it's just growing and it's great because I try to put in little sneak previews of what's coming on the show or who's coming on the show. And I also um, invite you guys to continue the conversation in the Telegram channel. So please check that out if you're on Telegram or if you've been thinking about getting on Telegram. And Maureen's in our group too, so you can even chat with her directly. All right, wonderful. Well, Maureen, I've known you since about 2018. We met at the Conscious Life Expo and um, I got a chance to interview you there for the first time, which was a lot of fun. And you guys, that video is up on the um, YouTube channel right now. So after tonight's show, if you want to go back in time, you can watch that interview as well. So Maureen, you know, you cover a lot of topics. <laughs> There's so much we could talk about tonight. And, you know, I love that you're a teacher because 
you get to work with so many different people on all of these topics, you know, and you get to um, look at it from a different perspective than, you know, a person who's just a student or a consumer or whatever of the spiritual realm. Um, and so I wanted to kind of dive right into the Akashic Records topic because it's such a fascinating topic for many. And I think, you know, you're quite one of the leading people in that field right now because you are teaching um, other people to become Akashic Realm readers. So I wanted to ask you, you know, if you could just quickly define what the Akashic Records are for people who may be unfamiliar with this term. Okay, so the word Akasha is Sanskrit for sky. So in, in a global sense, the word Akasha stands for anything that's in the sky. And and the term Akashic Records was, a pop, was popularized in the early 1900s by Blavatsky and others. And then when Edgar Cayce, the famous American mystic was asked about where was he pulling his information, he said the Akashic Records. And then he was asked, well, what are the Akashic Records? And they said, it's the book of life. So think mm -hmm. of the database of the life you are living now, past lives that you have experienced, and potential that you may be going to experience. And potential is kind of a loaded question, and I'll let you get into that when you're ready. But the idea mm -hmm. is that we have access to a bigger picture. And the way to understand that is to think about a movie that you have seen where they tell the story from one person's angle and then another person's angle and then another person's angle. And you get mm -hmm. to see the, the more rounded picture of what really happened. And that's kind of what happens in the records. You have your own opinion about what's going on. And then you open the Akashic Records and you get a much bigger picture. And I'll give you an example that was a really cool example. A man called in to a radio show that I was on and he was explaining that he had a daughter who was a young adult and she still treated him horribly. And he said he was a good father and he meditated regularly. You know, and he couldn't comprehend why she would behave so badly towards him. And um, through the record keepers, through me, he was told that you were adversaries in another lifetime. Hmm. And then you went on and grew spiritually, but she did not. And in this lifetime, you agreed to sponsor her. And she still sees you as her adversary. And she will come around, but it's up to you to keep loving her anyway, and in spite of that craziness. Now, as a parent, I can tell you that when you have a, an offspring that treats you badly, and I did have that experience, um, it's, it's very uh, painful. I mean, you put up with it, you you do what you can. Um, I never wanted to treat uh, my offspring the way I was treated. And I continued to love him anyway, because I didn't want to have any regrets. And I felt that maybe at some point he would come around and he did. Um, but it's hard for a parent to not know. And I can tell you from, because I'm so plugged in, that when I had my experience, and something really awful happened, I actually said out loud, well, I want to know when he's going to appreciate me. And my guides came in and said, when he's 28. And I burst out laughing because he was no, nowhere near age 28. And I remember thinking, I'm thinking like tomorrow or maybe next week. You know, I just made <laughs> him, you know, $2,000 when I was going in the bank and I just got fired, you know? <laughs> That's a great story. How can you say how old he was at the time? Approximately? Uh, maybe 24. Oh, okay. Cool so thing, it was like four cool. years. Yeah. Yeah. The cool thing is when, when I realized that that's what was going on, I realized that I personally had a barrier of expectation and it wasn't a big barrier. It wasn't like I was saying he should blah, blah, blah. I was just patiently waiting, you know? And, mm -hmm. um, I dropped that and said, you know what? It's okay if he never appreciates me. I'm I'm going to be fine. I'm going to be fine. I'm doing my part. And and I didn't have to wait till he was 28 because I accepted mm -hmm. the message that was coming through, not only, well, when he's 28, but also what am I doing to contribute to that drama? And I wasn't yeah. 
you know, I was being, I was giving him money for his college education. Um, you know, so it was a big drain on me personally as a single parent. Um, but then I got to thinking, you know what? I want to do this. I want to do this. It has nothing to do with him. It pleases me to be able to do this. And even though it's a big sacrifice and it's hard, I still want to do this. And, you know, once I got clear with that, it didn't matter what he did. Yeah, that's a, that's a great story. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so how did you become an Akashic Records reader? Like, did, did you have a life-changing event that made you say, hey, I've got to learn this? Or did your guides tell you? Or did it just come online for you? Can, can you share how you got into it and, and how you decided to teach others how to read? I'm, I, I, I'm not clear on... There was one event where I was given a message by my guides to get a message from an astrologer friend of mine and she was in atlanta and i was visiting in atlanta teaching there and um i called her house and left a message with her husband that i, I was so she had a message for me and when she called me back um i said to her would you are you going to update my chart and she said no wait just a minute you have to understand a couple of things number one i don't do messages for people I do messages for myself. My guides do talk to me, but I don't do messages for other people. So I wasn't happy when I got your message that I was supposed to have a message for you. But then I checked in with my guides and said, well, should I update her chart? And they said, no, we have a message for her. And the message was that I was being given access to a dimension that had been closed for eons. Hmm. And um, a, a number of other things that were more personal. And um, later, when I was working in the records, I said, so am I the only one that's gotten this access? You know, kind of like little smug me, you know? And um, <laughs> the, the guides came in and said, no, but you will be showing others how to get in. You will be a way shower for this. So I had some uh, otherworldly nudges to go into this um work and um you know I, I some i was kicking and screaming on a couple of occasions because um there are things that happen in life that make you think you're not supposed to do something or it wasn't like it was hard but i wasn't convinced that I was supposed to be the person to do it. You know, like, well, why am I supposed to do this? You know, surely Wes has done this before me. Mm -hmm. Not you. Yeah. That was a big uh, nudge that I had to uh, honor. And, you know, I think it's healthy to have that kind of attitude because then you're sure you're supposed to do it, you know? Joan of Arc and all the leaders who have been spiritual leaders kind of fought with it a little bit before, the, you know, J.C. fought with it a little bit. And I think it's healthy because it, it honors the message and the messenger wherever it's coming from mm -hmm. because it doesn't go away. And I guess that's a piece of advice anybody could take. You know, when you get a message, you're supposed to do something and it doesn't go away. It won't leave you alone. You kind of can figure that out. Mm hmm. Yeah. And it's a tough topic, I feel like, in a way, because you're getting access to past events, current events and future events when you go in there and do a reading. And so, you know, sometimes you might want not want to know something, but you're you're getting this information. You know what I mean? Like there's some um, uh, responsibility in knowing the future. Right. So, well, and, and remember, it's not a psychic reading. So it's not really about right. knowing the future as much as it is about knowing, you know, outcomes or stuff you think mm -hmm. is going to happen to um, impact a situation. Um, right. You know, one of, one of the stories from the early years was where a woman who was getting a session with me all the time, every month, and she's talking about the... Um, apartment that she's moving into it's a two bedroom and she's rented the other apartment to a guy that's a friend of a friend who's moving from the west coast to the east coast for a new job 
and he seemed like a regular guy. And so she uh, committed to renting to him. And um, as a kind of like as a passing question, she said, oh, by the way, um, how's it going to work out with my new roommate? And the record keeper said, well, it'll be fine until the luster wears off. <laughs> and one of the things you know when you're in the records is they do have this poetic way of speaking. They use bigger words that you and I would use in conversation. They use words mm -hmm. that I know. We've read books with those words in them, but we're not using those. We're not speaking that way. And so mm -hmm. um, when, she, when she heard this, she said, luster. What luster? Does that mean he's not going to last? And they said, <laughs> what? And then she said, well, when will he leave? And they said, uh, a month. They named a month. And then she said, of what year? Because it, it was the very next month after they moved in. And she couldn't comprehend that this guy would not last more than two months. Mm -hmm. And so when she, when she you know, grasped that information, she said, well, maybe I shouldn't rent to him. And the record keeper said, well, uh, we recommend that you do rent to him and it will lead you to the timing of the roommate of your dreams. Right. And, you know, wow. months later, the person that she ended up renting to this time turned out to be a very good friend. And they would even, they had so much fun together. They had they scheduled movie nights so they could have, you know, playtime together. And they were just friends. Mm -hmm. They weren't, you know, lovers or anything. It was just two girls. But, um Think of the benefit of knowing that this is likely to happen. Mm -hmm. so that when it does happen, you don't have to freak out because you know you're going to get something better mm -hmm. and it's going to be fine. Somehow it's going to work out. It'll be fine. Mm -hmm. It's funny. That story reminds me a lot of how I met Mark, my husband. It was a roommate situation and I had like to go through a bad roommate scenarios the timing worked out so that he could move in <laughs> it's <Wow>. kind of funny <laughs> that's how we met wow. now now the whole world knows <laughs> yeah, now the world knows. wow that's like yeah it. yeah that's awesome so just really quickly i want to say hello to everyone in the chat room we've got joshua benjamin shelly watt miranda dragon rose and we've got people from Vancouver. Hi, Becky. Kieran or Chiron from North Carolina. Yeah. Alpana from Ontario. And Brandon from Brooklyn, New York. And Carol from New Zealand, Auckland. Wow, how exciting. Thank you so much for sharing where you're from. And Dragon Rose, I see you. And Miranda Rivera, thank you so much. If I missed your name, Casey's son, Shelly Watt, please say hello. It's so fun to know you're all here with us from all around the country and the world. That's exciting. So Maureen, I was reading in your book, Waking Up in 5D, and um, we were talking, we, I was reading about, you know, the Akashic Records, and you mentioned that they exist in the 11th dimension. And so I was wondering, how is it that those of us in the third dimension or the fourth dimension or even the fifth dimension can access information in the 11th dimension? Um, well, it, it's important to understand that when the Akashic Records um, uh, protocol was brought forward uh, in recent times, it was done to allow humans to have the answer book to life's tests. So, you know, you think about a science or math test when you go in with your calculator or you go in with the tables, you know, for your chem chemistry test. And you use that information to, to make good decisions. You don't have to, you know, strike in the dark. And that's what, the, that's what I think of as the Akashic Records. And what happens is um, we were given access or permission to get this information through a cosmic dispensation so that we could catch up because humanity got behind. And the way we got behind, it doesn't matter. We were behind. And to get caught up, we were given access to this database, so to speak. Now, mm -hmm. um, the way we get in is because of the dispensation. So anybody who wants to learn can, even if you're not uh, psychic, even if you don't think you're intuitive, even if you don't think you have any skill at all, 
there is something that happens. It's like an overlay that comes over the person. And when they go through the effort of learning to how to access and to work with the materials. And, you know, the way I teach a class, I give people lots of resources on, um, on how to validate what's happening. So what happens is um, when they start, information just flows into their head and out their mouth. And, and because of that, you don't remember what was said in a session. And that's because you were not thinking it. You weren't processing it. You were simply channeling it. It comes right through. And that's really the true meaning of a channel. So we're channeling um, into the 11th dimension. So it's a little bit like a stargate or a portal. So we, we um, tune ourselves up as high as we can, which is usually 5D. And then we go into the uh, zone where the mm -hmm. records are and we're literally plugged in. That's awesome. And did you write, did you say something like, it's like going into a tunnel when you're underwater. So you're like going through the water, but it's not touching you or something like yeah, that. Yeah. That, like that was pretty cool. Yeah. TV shows got started, but you're not really conscious of that happening. What you're okay. conscious of is that you start to say something and words just float into your head and out your mouth really fast. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, it, uh, one of the funny things that happens is, you know, I, I meet with, with the people who are um, under my umbrella. You know, I've trained thousands of people, but, you know, I only have a few people in my group. And I meet with them every month. And uh, every once in a while, someone will share, you know, what they got in the records. And then they'll joke around and say, you know, I can't believe I, I you know, it was so amazing. I can't believe I said that. And, of course, the response is, right, you didn't. That was the record keepers. <laughs> Right. <laughs> exactly. You know, and you one, of the, one of the things that oh, happens go ahead. when you're when you're in the Akashic Records, they will use what you like. So for example, I really love alliteration. So when they want really want to emphasize a point, they'll use a string of words like um, Wisdom Wednesday wins uh, um, William's heart. And mm -hmm. and you know you can't miss that they're <laughs> making a point here. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, so, you know, um, that part's cool. And the other part is this great feeling of, of being mm -hmm. cherished is so mm -hmm. powerful that I've had people tell me, I go in the Akashic Records every day just to have that feeling, just to get that feeling. Wow. Drug. That's amazing. Yeah. What's a really common question that you get from people who, when you were doing readings, what's a really common question like people want to know from the Akashic Records? Like well, what kind of information? Know, they want to know about their relationships. So they want to know, you know, what can be known about my relationship or, you know, mm -hmm. here's what's going on and what can, what can the record keepers help me to understand about the situation? Um, they ask questions about their career you know, what's my purpose is probably the number one question. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when we, when someone comes in our, uh, under our lineage, we send them a list of questions that they can ask. Because a lot of times people think, you know, I really want to know more about my life path, but I don't know what to ask. And so we send them a list of potential questions. And so um, those questions can include, um, what's the best use of my gifts? Um, how could I make my family members happier? Um, what is the most important thing for me to know now? You know, and it's very interesting how this plays out because, you know, I've had such amazing information come through. Uh, for example, one time a woman started telling me a big story about her daughter's ex-boyfriend who somehow the cats all died under his care. And oh my goodness. She was sure that you know he had done something um, inappropriate. We'll just leave it at that. And uh, so she wanted to know if the ex-boyfriend was responsible for those cats dying. And the record keeper, I, and I'm thinking, oh my God, she's going to tell everybody in her in her state that Maureen Saint Germain said X Y Z, uh, that that you know the ex-boyfriend killed the cats. And I'm thinking, I don't want to be the messenger for that. So. I said, um, <laughs> right. I think myself, you know, this, this is all happening in the background because in the foreground, the record keepers just are talking. And what they said to her was, you do not need your record keepers to confirm that which you already know. Mm. And I, uh, wow. I'm off the hook. 
Right. <laughs> Thank yeah. God. Right. And, and, and there are times that you mm-hmm. you you know bad information. And, and, and bad information is not the right word, but you know, disconcerting information, frustrating, yeah. you know, scary or, or or information that you know is hard to deliver. And um, when a person asks that question, most of the time they already know the answer, but they're looking to find out if it's really true. You know, like right. my grandma doesn't have much time to live, or or my my partner's you know doing something on the sly, or stealing, or whatever, you know, stuff like that, and. One of the things that I teach the guides is, you know, you you don't call up somebody and say, Grandma died. You usually say, you know, Grandma's been sick or or something terrible has happened or I need to give you some bad news. Are you sitting down? You know, you kind of set the stage before you deliver it. So the Mm -hmm. same way during the records, you know, if they ask you a pointed question about what's going on with Grandma and you're actually going to be with us much longer, you know, we say... um, I'm really uncomfortable with the um, information. And then the client can say, well, it's okay. I, I pretty much know the answer. Go ahead. Right. Now, when you deliver it, because, you know, you don't want them to, you know, go after the messenger. <laughs> right. It is. It can be tough to deliver not so good news for sure. Wow. So we have some questions in the chat room. Um and if you guys have any questions about the Akashic Records, I'd love to ask Maureen those questions now because I do want to shift gears a little bit and talk about some other stuff that we have going on in the world right now. Um, but Brandon says, I took level one of the Akashic Records course with Terry. And yes, to me, it feels like I am one of those court transcribers just listening and writing but for myself, LOL. I'll put his comment up on the screen so you can see it yeah, too. Terry more. is one of my uh, certified teachers. Yeah. So that's actually- Terry is? Yeah. 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 That's what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So awesome. he learned with her and um, she's, you know, been with me. She's even traveled, Terry has even traveled with me to China. She's a very capable teacher. Awesome. And Joshua has a comment. He says, knowing or Gnostic Gnosis is gained through lines up the first finger, the Jupiter finger. I'm not familiar with that. Lines up the Mercury or little finger, telepathic connection to everyone else. Yes. And that is a um, piece of information that comes from those of us who have studied palmistry. And so the okay. fingers are named after a planet. And so your first oh, finger interesting. is the Jupiter finger. Um, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for your comments, Joshua and Brandon. I appreciate you. And hello to Shelly from Canada. We've got more people coming in. So that's awesome. So, you know, last night I did a show about, you know, a darker topic and I don't usually like to go down that road, but I just feel like it's a little bit timely right now, Maureen, because I feel like, You know, you talk about polarization and waking up in 5D and you said that, you know, humans were chosen to hold both the light and the dark and polarity. And I feel like we are now in the most polarized (laughs) version of the earth, at least in my lifetime. I'm sure, you know, it's happened before because history repeats itself. But it just feels like, you know, as we go through this ascension, we're really polarized. And um, I've been getting reports of, you know, people having a lot more shadow stuff show up in their reality, psychic attacks, bad news, you know, health issues, stuff like that. Can you speak on that a little bit and, well, you know, and, and, and share why the dark forces seem to be ramping up? Well, there's a couple of things we needed to recognize. Number one, we were given the palette of polarity, light and dark, to have experiences and to choose the light. Mm-hmm. So we have enough experiences that we decide we don't like the dark anymore and we don't want it. Um, it is my belief that the reason we're seeing so much more Uh-oh. fierceness. Oh, dear. Now, I'm hardwired in. Can you hear me You're now? back. You're back. Okay. Yes. So, <laughs> So, so that's a classic example of, of being mm-hmm. stuck, you guys. Um, so I, it is my belief that the reason we are seeing more of this at this time 
is because they are exiting and they're screaming bloody murder um, as they're exiting, you know, and they're doing everything they can to scare you and get you to back down and, and not choose the light, you know, to choose, you know, because when people behave badly towards you and all you do is say, look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to stick around for that. But you know, if, if you need something from them, then you, you look the other way or you behave in a gracious way. Mm -hmm. So, but the dark forces that are stepping up are simply because they're getting cleaned out, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, this reminds me of when, when I was younger, I used to get facials and um, I went to a clinic, you know, where they gave me mm -hmm. these facials and the day after my facials she would you know i would have all these little blackheads and stuff that they would clear out of my skin and the day after my facial i looked horrible but a couple of days after that i looked fantastic and so that's what we do. <laughs> it's the day after your facial you guys <laughs> that's, that's that a one. great that's a great one it's yeah. a great way to put it yeah and i feel like um you know, it's like that saying it, the the darkest night is just before the dawn, you know, like we're in that final hurrah phase of like them and, trying to win. But, you know, the light is winning. The, the, the other thing to think about, um, and I'll, I'll say something about the light winning also. The other thing to think about is there's a lot of people that are in denial about what's really going on. And those mm -hmm. people have to choose. Now, you know, in, in my next book well actually in, in book uh waking uh, beyond the flower of life i i wrote this 15 years ago and then i rewrote it recently you know and just re-edited it and stuff like that and i mentioned that there are three earths one crash and burn earth one earth that is ascending and one earth that's the do over earth and the do over earth is all the people who are do-gooders who are good people but they're in denial about who they are as a God-free being. They're in denial about the fact that they don't have to follow someone else to be a holy person or to be a loving, respectful person. So those people have to wake up to their own sovereignty. And the ascending earth and the do over earth are interacting. Uh, and they will continue to interact with the idea that at some point that do over earth group can move up with the ascending earth. Um, so even though we're seeing more of the difficulties, it actually gets people's attention. You know, there are people that I have encountered that stepped away from the spiritual work 10, 20 years, and now they're back. And that's mm -hmm. really... How can you walk away from this? But they did. You know, they had lives they wanted to live and they didn't want to have anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. But now, now they figured out, yeah. oh, I better be back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel like it's just a time when, you know, everyone, a lot of people are coming online, right? And as we go through this ascension and we get closer and closer to 5D, um, we become better manifestors. We, we manifest more instantly. We recognize the synchronicities. And so that's why it's so uh, important to be careful how you direct your energy towards someone because it, it's really working, right? Because you're manifesting that and they might be feeling it if they're sensitive or, you know, maybe even if they're not sensitive. So that was something I touched on because I feel like as we, as the veils thin, and we become these instant manifestors, we, we really need to take responsibility and live in right action and right speech and all of that, you know, as you know, we and, move forward. and say, you know, people don't realize when they're, they're doing black magic a lot of times. And it seems like, how could they not know? And the answer is pretty simple. And I'll give you an example. Let's say um, a woman is talking to her close friend and she discovers that her close friend has just gone through um, a physical um, situation and has been um, violated. And the friend makes some comment like, blankety blank, all men. That's a curse. Mm -hmm. 
Right. We don't, do that. we don't need to make judgments on people, especially global ones. And even though it's not right what happens to the friend, that friend needs their sympathy. They don't need us calling out names. It's tricky. Exactly. Really tricky. Yeah. Exactly, because um, when we direct our energy out, you know, it could be a subconscious, uh, you know, I just, I'm jealous of that person or I'm angry at that person or whatever, all the way to black magic, intentional black magic, right? So there's a whole spectrum of how energy is being directed amongst each other. And you talked about like humanity, what's that phrase you use? Like humanity is going against humanity or something yeah. like that? Inhumanity to man. Say that again, please. You cut out. Okay. Man's inhumanity to man. Exactly. So you talked about that in your book too. And can you talk a little bit about like, you know, I feel like it was worse before, right? Like in the middle ages. <laughs> and now we've kind of evolved a little bit and hopefully we will continue. Well, I think that on the surface we have evolved. Um, but I think there's a sub, subculture that a lot of people don't know about um, that is also going on that's far worse than what we thought we knew of the Middle Ages. Um, I will also say that there is a way to understand this would be to read the book Confessions of a Rebel Angel. And the author of that book is no longer living, but he did endorse my books. And he writes about... Um, the, the story is told by the rebel angel herself. She refers to herself as Georgia and how they are now redeeming themselves. But, it, you know, she explains what, what, what went down and how it went down. So I want to say that we've had overseers who had agendas that were out of alignment with what the, div the divine saw for us. And because mm -hmm. they were charged with that job, they were given the opportunity to make those decisions and that pushed all of humanity in a direction that we're now trying to recover from. So that's part of it. And the other part of it is our naivete. You know, we've not really understood how much, how close to the danger zone we have been in. Mm -hmm. Right. And it feels like anytime there's going to be a big reveal, it gets like, like swept under the rug again or something like covered up again, which is well, so you know, interesting. I had a conversation with an astrologer friend of mine and um, she said that there's three, there's four planets in critical positions and two planets in critical angles. And I, I said, to her, what do you mean by critical? What does that mean? And, you know, I'm thinking, you know, what kind of trouble are we in? And she said, I have never seen six planets on the new moon like this in challenging positions. And so I said, again, so what does that mean? And she said, mm -hmm. well, all the, all the dark energies of, you know, like Mercury retrograde has benefits and, dis, and disadvantages. A lot of people don't think about the benefits because they're only worried about the disadvantages, but take mm -hmm. that one thing and then amplify it with every planet has the, the downside of its personality or profile and, and, you know, put it in a difficult angle and watch what happens. You know, it's when, when you are stressed, for example, maybe you're not as patient with your kids or when I'm stressed, maybe I'm not as patient with my spouse. So think of that kind of situation, but six planets in a new moon and the new moon sets the stage for the next cycle. So what we're talking about here, and again, I'm an amateur, I'm not an astrologer, I like to say I know enough to be dangerous. Um, what I do know is that we're coming up on something really big. And so mm -hmm. even though we get close and then it backs off, we get close and it backs off, there has been a lot of things that have happened that we came close to having a breakthrough. And then some situation caused that to not be able to take fruition. So it was thwarted. Kind of like you're about to get married and somebody comes rushing in. Don't do this. 
and they have <laughs> boundaries and I'm she's so married to me, you know. Um like that. And so the, the yeah. interference. And so these these reveals as, as you referred to them are hitting up against interference. And I do believe that we're going to have, you know, a, a big pushback. And that's the other reason why we're seeing so much darkness, you know, for everybody. They mm -hmm. are really struggling to hold the light. So uh, as we talk about this, one of the things I'd like to do is ask people to do a couple of things. Number one, I'd like to ask you and invite you to say, I'm asking for a day of heaven on earth for me and everyone I come in contact with, everyone I'm in contact with. And what that does, it sets the stage in 5D. So that's one thing. Another thing you can do is you can announce, I'm waking up in 5D when you go to bed at night. And that also mm -hmm. sets the stage that no matter what happens at that night, you wake up in 5D and you wake up in this joyful place. Um, and then when you hear things that you know are frightening or scary to uh, not only to say a prayer for those people, but to ask for interference from the angels and the dragons and the beings of light. You know, we mm -hmm. have the power and the authority to call those guys in. But if we don't do it, then, you know, their hands are a little bit tied. So if we're mm -hmm. not asking, and I'm not saying that, you know, the ETs or the dolphins and the whales or the um, angelic realm or any of those unseen helpers are going to save us. But I do know that when we ask for help, it is more forthcoming and it's silly not to. It's just plain silly not to because it is, you know, the price is right. Right. <laughs> well, thank you for that reminder. That's so important that we set the intentions. Like I feel like life is all about intentions. I mean, everything we do is intentions, you know, whether they're good or bad. So again, back to, you know, being really careful with our words and how we direct energy at each other. Um, especially right now where there's, it feels like we're in this great divide. Um, we need to find a way to love each other despite our differences. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> I would love for you to share a little bit about your protocol on how we can attune ourselves to connect with our higher selves and ask for more guidance. You've got a really great, simple protocol for that. And, you know, people call you the practical mystic because you you have a lot of practical tools and tips and you um, share with people of like, Hey guys, it's just this simple, but you've got to do the work. Right. So can you share your protocol for connecting to your higher self and getting those gu guidance, those quick um, questions answered as we go through our daily lives? So, um, and, and I would really like to do that. I have it right in front of me on my little worksheet here. I also have it in my head but I want to make sure I'm covering everything. But what I want to say before we do that is, you know, I'm just like everybody else. I was married for 25 years the first time. I had four sons. I am, you know, happily married a second time. I have been close to bankruptcy twice and uh, recovered from that. And these were huge debts. Um, you know, I had a situation where my first husband left me with all the family debt and I could file bankruptcy or I could pay the debt. So I've been around the block. I've been fired a bunch of times from corporate jobs. So, you know, whatever you've been through, I probably have been through it too. And one of the things that I have figured out is that there's always a solution if you're willing to ask for it. So mm -hmm. I remember a time that I was almost bankrupt from something some people did to sabotage me. And I went to bed that night and I said to the Ascended Master, don't worry, I think I'm bankrupt. But if there's a solution, I need to know by tomorrow morning. And in the morning, I had a solution. And so I know that no matter what you're going through as a listener, you can have a solution that will help you and support you. And mm -hmm. I have great empathy for no matter where you're at in life, because I have been there. I've, I've endured. So there are three easy steps to connect with your higher self and get 100% accuracy. And this should be my calling card. I think it is actually. Um, you have to do this for 45 days. And the first one is you ask only yes or no questions for 45 days. Um, no open-ended questions, no future questions, just yes, no questions about what you, action you're gonna take. That's the first rule of thumb. The second rule of thumb is follow through. And that may seem uh, obvious, but you know, 
as I said to someone earlier today, this is my daily allotment of chips. When they're gone, they're gone. I do not ask my higher self if I should have them. <laughs> I just have them. <laughs> That's I a great idea. So you don't have <laughs> questions that you're not willing to follow through. And that gets pretty funny sometimes. And mm -hmm. finally, you don't use any other form of divination during your practice period. So your practice period is 45 days. You don't use your pendulum, your muscle testing, or any of that stuff for 45 days. And the obvious answer on why is that, that you're not allowed to do anything else, and that is... Um, <laughs> you don't learn you don't learn German and French at the same time. You take your time learning one, and then you learn the next one. So, right. what we do is we I, I will walk you through a very short meditation where you will ask your higher self for symbols or signals, and and um, that usually gives you your setup. And you can have all kinds of symbols or signals. Some people get pictures, they get geometric shapes. Some people get like a thumbs up for yes and a thumbs down for no. Um, and so you're, you're going to ask your higher self to show you your symbol. Um, mm -hmm. Some people actually hear the word yes or no, and that's wonderful. Um, so there is a workaround if you don't get a symbol or signal. But don't try to think it right now. Just know that you're going to get something that will show up. So shall we go ahead and do that? Sure. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So take a moment and put your feet flat on the floor. Try and have your back straight. And now close your eyes if you feel like it. And uh, think of something that makes you really happy. Holding a pet or an infant, a walk on the beach, or a hike in the mountains. And let your heart energy expand. This is actually what it feels like when your heart chakra opens. Now send that energy like a beam of light up your pranic tube, the tube that sits in front of your spine. So it goes from your heart to your third chakra, third eye, crown chakra, all the way up to the eighth chakra, which is the uh, portal where your higher self comes in. Soul star. And now send that love and light from your higher self back down into your heart. So you've now connected yourself to your higher self. You've widened the channel because you've allowed your higher self to come in. And now with your higher self in your heart, ask your higher self to show you your symbol or signal for yes. So higher self, show me my symbol or signal for yes. Thank you. Higher self, show it to me again. Thank you. Higher self, show me my symbol or signal for no. Is it a sensation in the body, an itchy ear, a visual? Higher self, show me my symbol or signal for neutral. Neutral can be a, a feeling of emptiness in the center of your body. Some people who are visual see a flat line like a horizon. Again, higher self, show me my symbol for neutral. Thank you. Now, let's play. Higher self, let's practice. Show me my symbol for yes. Show me my symbol for no. Show me my symbol for neutral. Now take a moment and write them down. Now, while you're writing down, I'll, I'll tell you um, a couple of funny stories. One time a woman came to class and it was at a conference center in China that we were teaching us. And she said, why would my higher self lie to me? And I said, well, what did you ask? And she said, well, I'm a vegan. And I asked my higher self this morning if I should eat meat at breakfast. And my higher <laughs> self said, yes. And I just started wow. And I said, well, let's see now. I think it broke both two of the three rules. Number one, um, you weren't willing to do this. Number two, you were testing. You weren't asking questions about stuff you didn't care about. You cared deeply about remaining a vegan, right? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, then why would you ask that question? You're only supposed to ask questions that are unimportant and insignificant for the first six weeks. And why mm -hmm. do we do that? Because it's the same way we make other kinds of decisions. When you decide you're going to buy something, let's say you're going to buy a car. You do some research, you talk to your friends, you go online, 
Um, you test drive the cars. You do all this work to get a, a bunch of data to help you decide. Mm -hmm. You don't have any data that says your intuition's right because you're not keeping score, you're not keeping track. But if you're asking about a bunch of unimportant stuff and cool stuff happens, then you have the ability to say, ah, I've got this history and your ego, your personality is looking at that thinking, you know what, even when it didn't seem to matter, the higher self was always right. You know, so you ask your higher self, what restaurant should we go to? Should we go to this one? No, this one, no, this one, yes. And you walk in and you meet somebody that you've been looking for, that you had lost touch with. Or, mm -hmm. you know, you, you're with a bunch of people and you ask your higher self which meal to order and your higher self tells you, you know, we're 13. So you order that meal and it turns out to be the best meal at the whole table. And so fun things start to happen that you begin to notice. So now you have your own personal track record. Your own personal track record. <laughs> and I want to say hi to Angela. Oh, my gosh. He is my Taiwanese student and teacher. He teaches my work in Taiwan. And he's also the most amazing translator for me in China. So he's oh, wow. an extraordinarily talented man deeply spiritual and a really good friend. So good for you for awesome. being so glad you saw the notice and, and joined me. <laughs> Sorry for the distraction, but I just All felt right. the energy I felt the energy yeah. like, oh you gotta tell her I'm here. <laughs> yeah, that's very yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. I think you have quite a few friends in the chat room actually. So um, when you when you um when you when you practice this, you do it for six weeks with a sense of joy, a sense mm -hmm. of childlike enthusiasm, and you do it with fun. You know, mm -hmm. um, there's so many funny examples of amazingly wonderful things that happen as a result of checking in. And, mm -hmm. you know, in our, in our house now, you know, every time we don't know what we want to do, we check in, ask higher ourselves, what's mm -hmm. the, highest, the best choice? It's great. That's wonderful. It's such a great protocol. Um, I think the hardest part when you're first getting started is remembering to keep asking the questions, right? The right. simple questions like, what what color shirt should I wear? What, you know, which shoes should I wear? What should I have for breakfast? Or, you and know, should I go left or right or whatever? We And we have to remember that even though you and I mm -hmm. talk this way and we say, should I do this? Should I do that? When you're checking in with your guidance of your higher self, you actually need to say the higher self's name because I have had it happen for myself and the students. When they don't say higher self, what happens is something else comes in and answers. You know, the, the little girl in me who wants to be special or, you know, some other energy. So um, right. you have to ask a certain way. So you ask higher self, is it in mm -hmm. my highest and best good? And even though we say, should I do this? When we go to ask the higher self, it's always higher self. Should I get this best and put it on like that? Um, right. You say higher self is not my highest best good to wear this best for this event now, you know, and you don't ask a lot about the future stuff unless you have to know. So, you know, if your boss is saying, give me your vacation schedule for next year. Well, that's a good thing to, to um, ask. But remember that the more you practice, and this is what Sherry was saying, the the during your practice period, the more you are willing to be playful, the better you get. Um, mm -hmm. And remember, you could ask 30 to 40 questions a day. And that right. would give you, and, and the thing is, it's not like piano practice where you have to sit down and not do anything else. You can, you know, check in and take a few seconds and, and do that. You know, one of the, one of the early stories of, of a class, we taught this in a class and a woman came to class wearing this very odd, combination of clothing and jewelry and you know how women give each other that look you know that look that we give each other right <laughs> up and okay. down look <laughs> yeah up and down look that, that eyeballing I like her top and what did she do to her hair you know that kind of stuff so, <laughs> so she noticed this other lady giving her this look and she said don't even ask my higher self dressed me this morning <laughs> That's awesome. You really have to be willing to play. And for somebody <laughs> had a great laugh over it. 
That's hilarious. That's so great. That's a great story. It's funny, you know, when I left you in Arizona last month and, or was it this month? I can't even remember. But when I left you, I started doing it and I kept getting my yes was they touched the top of my head. And I asked again just now, and I got a touch on the top of my head again, but I, I didn't get the no or the neutral, but I get the, I get the yeses really clear. Well, that's actually is- because that means don't worry about all the other stuff, you know, and, and I joke around with people, you know, you can go anywhere you want to go in your car, only making right turns. It might take you a little longer. So at least you have <laughs> one signal for yes. Nothing else matters. Right. <laughs> we only want the, the yes questions anyways. <laughs> That's fun. That's awesome. So you guys, if you have any questions, um, please let me know. This is a great time to put them in the chat room as we enter the second hour. I can't believe an hour has already gone by. Um, so I think we have a question here from Carol Bird, and I might go out of order. So if I don't get to your question in order, please uh, just, I will get to your question. Carol Bird says, I have a question regarding young people, particularly teenagers. They seem to be struggling in the systems a lot now. It's also not easy to get them into meditation, thinking that it's not cool. And with their hormones, their emotions can be much affected by the chaotic vibes or planetary influences. Is there any way to help them? I've also asked for higher beings help. Um, I think you're on to your own answer, Carol, by asking for your angels and guides to help, you know, and learning to understand their personality through their basic astrology is helpful. You know, the one son of mine that was a Taurus, I never told him what to do. I always said, you can do this or this. What what do you prefer? So that he Mm -hmm. is a stubborn man, a stubborn Taurus, you know, a stubborn little boy, you know, because if I, I remember when I said to him one time that he had to get dressed. And he stayed in his pajamas all day. <laughs> <laughs> I never did that. Again. I figured that out. So, you know, it is helpful to learn a little bit about basic astrology so you can look at that personality type. And there's a book called um, The Only Astrology Book You'll Ever Need. And it's I have that. I have that book. Martin Wolfork, something like that. Anyway, yeah, it's, it's awesome. a wonderful book. It's about this thick. You can get it in the library, and you can also probably get it on Kindle now. But it's been around mm-hmm. forever because I used it with my own children. And that mm-hmm. will help just with their basic birthday information and stuff. And then right. um, the other thing that you can do is when things get out of hand, to just take a half a step back and ask for your angels and guides to overshadow you and help you say the right thing. One of the prayers that I would say every day um, as a single parent was, I'm asking for the mantle of the divine mother to overshadow me. And so, you know, it's like that stolen Mm -hmm. priest wear, you know, so it's like a mantle Mm -hmm. shawl of the divine mother to overshadow me so that I could be the best mom possible. And because I, you know, as a single mom, I was terrified that I would fail. I was terrified that I would somehow, you know, not cover enough of the bases to, um, you know, whatever they needed. Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, those, those are very powerful tools. And one other thing, if you've got like a preteen that's not cooperating and not working with you and you, you know, you want to throttle them, what you want to do is put your hands on their shoulders. And when you put your hands on their shoulders, you've connected your heart to their heart. And mm-hmm. now you can talk to them. They can't, you're not, you're not squeezing them or you know, shaking them. You're just gently holding your hands on their shoulders in a loving way, but not trying to hug them. You're simply holding them and saying, look, I need you to understand, blah, blah, blah. And I will tell mm-hmm. a story that myself one time. As a parent, you know, a single parent, you know, sometimes you just don't feel like you're getting through. And I don't know what it was that I was upset about. Um, but I basically, you know, read the right act and said, this, you know, you can't keep doing this, whatever it was. And for whatever reason, because I wasn't getting the reaction I wanted, you know, contrite, sorry, um, some kind of reaction. I was getting like blank faces, right? I repeated myself and I didn't know I did it. 
Okay. I'm totally out of touch with what's going on. And mm -hmm. that came up and put her paw on my thigh. I mean, she went way up on my thigh and just dug her claws into me. And, you know, my eyes got really big. My eyes <laughs> uh, started. Oh my goodness. And I, I looked at my sons and I said, I guess I'm done. And we all cracked up. <laughs> Wow, what a story. Your cat was like, cool it, lady. <laughs> wow. Don't 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 repeat yourself. They heard you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I love what you said about putting your hands on their shoulders because when we connect with our children that way, I've noticed that when I get really close to my son and I have a message to deliver or I really need him to hear me, that's the best way he hears me. You know, if I yell at him from across the room, he probably heard like 10% of what I said. And all he heard was mom's yelling at me across the room. So <laughs> I know when it's important, I've got to like get in there and get that close contact because it really and, you know, once they're teenagers, this is something else that I learned by osmosis from mm -hmm. my own mother. And that is stop telling them what you would do in that situation or what they should do in that situation. Mm -hmm. And instead say, how are you going to solve that? Right. What are you going to do to fix that? Mm -hmm. and what happens is they default to what you've taught them. But if you tell them, then they got to prove that they can think for themselves. So you may as well right. encourage them to think for themselves and let them default to what you've taught them. And it does mm -hmm. work. So when you, when your kids are, you know, 12, 13, you've taught them everything you can teach them. And the next thing you have to do is be the cheerleader. And how are you going to solve that? I'm sure you'll figure it out. You know, mm -hmm. you may, you know, you may walk outside and scream. You know, I'm not saying you won't like what's going to happen, but what I know is that they will make better decisions if you're if you're behind them than if you're telling them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I agree, and that's such great advice as my children are in, are approaching those ages, <laughs> those difficult ages. Um, Carol says, thank you so much. Really helpful, Maureen. Uh, Sheree, what's the name of the astrology book again? It's called The Only Astrology Book You'll Ever Need. It's a great title. <laughs> and it's true. It really, um, yeah, I'll sure. type it in the chat room for and you. The first name is, escapes me, but her middle name is Martine. And her last name is Woolfork. W-O-O-L-F-O-R-K or F-O-R-D, something like that. Well, for it, maybe. Yeah, I could, I could grab it, but I'm, I'm afraid to go get it because then my kids will tackle me and they'll, they won't let me come back. <laughs> okay, awesome. So um, I would love to talk about uh, multidimensionality with you if that's a topic that you would like to approach tonight. I know that... Um, it comes up a lot in the work that you do. And, you know, it's still kind of a new, not new, but it's kind of a topic that, you know, is still kind of considered fringe, unless it's something one is really into or really studying. Um, can you speak a little bit about our multidimensionality and how, um, you know, for example, we can all have uh, two outcomes, two potential outcomes, that could could happen simultaneously at the same time. So if you have, you know, a fork in the road, you could go one way or you might be going both ways in two different dimensions. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the, the sequential kind of uh, multidimensional um, awareness first. And that would be where you see yourself in an environment that you didn't choose and it might be in a meditation or mind wandering that kind of thing or a dream time um, one of my people one of my clients had a reoccurring dream with an old boyfriend and she was happily married with her new husband and she couldn't comprehend why this guy kept showing up in her dream time since she wasn't really thinking about him that much but mm -hmm. the other guy was thinking about her and his energy was jumping into her in the 
dream time because he couldn't reach her in the 3D. Um, <clears throat> so that's an alternate version of the reality that she is experiencing with him because she, they were having experiences in the dream time. Um, in another case, a woman and her husband who stood up, she saw herself in the dream time still being married to him and, you know, going down that path. And then in the, the what we call the, three, the real time or the 3D time, uh, you know, they, they, were, they had divorced. Now, um, when you make a decision, you're actually, there's five possible choices when you make a decision. And um, two below grade, two above grade, and one ideal choice. Most people who are listening to this call, you're not even going to go to the two below grades. You're always working with the top three choices. And those top three choices are all good. They're going to take you towards your outcome. But of those three, you know, one may be slightly better than the other. And the ideal choice may even be non-intuitive. And so it is less likely. So if you get pulled in that direction, it doesn't seem to make sense. It may very well be that that is the ideal choice because it is so different from the other two. So when you um, make a choice, you are also funding with your energy the version of the choice that you didn't take. And an easy way to explain this is if you're um, going to go to college and you're applying to a couple of different places, and maybe you get accepted, you apply to five places, you get accepted at two places, so now you're projecting yourself into one college mentally and you're projecting yourself into the other college mentally and you, you move through that process back and forth, back and forth you go um, until you make your decision on what to do. So maybe you move in that direction and you you take the choice that you thought was the best choice and you're in college now for a couple of months and you realize you made the wrong choice. You're not happy here and, and you get it. The, the other place would have been a better choice. So you drop out of the first place and you you know, you reapply to the second place and you get in and you transfer and you, you finally figure out that this was what you were meant to do. Both of those timelines are continuing to be funded until you make the hard decision. Uh, I'm in the right place. I'm so grateful I made this decision. And then little by little, you are defunding it. And it's a little bit like your roots in that version of the reality start to fade. And then you mm -hmm. don't connect with it anymore. Yeah, that's a great um, story or analogy. I could feel that, you know, as I'm moving, I was considering Utah and Arizona, and I could feel like a part of myself already there, right? Like I could feel myself in that timeline, what it would feel like, what it would look like. Um, and, you know, because it's like in this potential phase, which is kind of exciting and fun, but also scary. <laughs> You know, so it's kind of really interesting how that works, how we have these um, opportunities, if you will. And, and, and it's like you're, it's like part of you is already there living that, that in that space and in that place or in that college or whatever it is. I think it's so fascinating. Yeah. And sometimes when we, um, when things don't end the way we want it, you know, we get fired from a job, we lose the sweetheart that we thought we were going to make it with. Mm -hmm. We have what I would call regret. And the more regret we have, the more we fund the alternate reality. So in the example of the married couple that split apart and then in the dream time, she's seeing herself so with him and how their life is. Um, the, the less guilty they each felt, the less funding they were giving to these other versions of the reality. So you, you think of it as give up the guilt, give up the regret. Once you make your decision, it's great. And if you don't like it, there is no uh, sin or crime in changing your mind. Mm -hmm. You could sign a contract to do something and you find out it's not working. You're not happy. It's not a good fit for whatever reason to, to say to the other party, look, you know, I thought this was going to work. I'm not happy. You might not be happy with me either, but I'm not happy. And I need, I need to change what I agreed. At that point, you come clean. You've given them the opportunity. And that then you absolve yourself because you don't want to carry around, you know, guilt or regret. Um, because then the, those what ifs kind of 
dangle the alternate version that keeps coming back to haunt you. Right. Yeah. Good advice. Thank you so much. So everyone watching, um, thank you so much for being here. If you're enjoying this conversation, please like this video and please subscribe. And also go check out Maureen's YouTube channel, Maureen St. Germain. I'm sure you just have to Google or search on YouTube. You'll find her very easily. Um, and also, I just want to say there's 40 or 50 of you with us tonight. Please put your questions in the chat room. You guys are also, I can feel your energy. You're like so polite and you're just like hanging in there with us. But I really want to hear what you have to say. So don't be shy. Please put your questions in the chat room in all caps. I would love for you to be able to engage with Maureen directly. And um, we have a poet in the chat room, Joshua. He's putting these lovely poetry sayings in the comments below. Um, and I appreciate you. But if you have a question, please put it in all caps. That way I know to pause and ask Maureen. <laughs> so awesome. So what else can we cover tonight, Maureen? What else do you have coming up, coming online? What kinds of things, uh, you know, how can people take courses with you? I think that's a big question. Um, I have an Akashic Records class. Right now it's scheduled for December, but I recently learned that it may get moved to January. I don't run my schedule. Um, as one good friend said to one of my family members, you know, when God gave Maureen all those gifts, he took something away. And it's kind of a family joke that I could travel all over the world by myself for years and years and years and, you know, basically the only flight I ever missed was the one that was to meet my future husband. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I didn't know he was going to be my future husband at the time. You know how that goes. And mm -hmm. so, so um, one of the things that I would like to encourage you to do is if you have an interest in learning more about this book, Waking Up in 5D and how it works and, all the cool information in here. Um, you know, I have a membership program. It's only $11 a month. So you can sign up for that, get lots of videos from me that give you more information that's even in the book. And then I also do a live session with people every month in that group. So even that is worth the investment. Um, one, uh, one of the things that uh, I want everyone to understand is that we are moving from polarity into non-polarity. And it doesn't mean you won't have choice. It means you won't have the choice to choose not God. And that's a very interesting concept because remember in the beginning when we were talking, humans were given the ability to choose uh, polarity and have these mm -hmm. experiences so that they would learn that they preferred God. Okay. And we're now at the place where we're recognizing, okay, you know what? I definitely prefer a God choice. And what that means is all the not God choices fall away. They don't occur to you. And, and how does that work? Well, when somebody comes to your house, you almost always offer them a glass of water. You invite them to sit down like that. You wouldn't just have them come in and sit down and, and talk to them and not do something to show that they were welcome. Okay. So, it's not possible for you to have them do that. It's not likely for you to do that. That's like not having the not God choice. That part of the reality just falls away. And you only think of good things to do. You only, and you don't have to label them good because they're all good. So that's really <laughs> right. And one of the ways that I teach in this book on how to do this is to change your vocabulary, to be proactively changing your vocabulary. So for example, um, I was in the store with my husband the other day and he's looking at throw pillows with me and we're trying to figure out what we want to get for our living room. And he said, well, that's a bad color. And I, I just looked at him and I said, could you rephrase that? You know, <laughs> starts to laugh. And he says, this color doesn't appeal to me or I don't think it'll look good in our living room or whatever. But you see the difference? You don't want to yes. label it as good or bad. You don't want to say... Mm -hmm. Uh, even if that's a bad neighborhood, that's a number of neighborhood where there's some problems mm -hmm. rather than, you know, making these global statements, good or bad, right or wrong. So how do you answer people when you want 
to say that they were right or or that they got it right, you know. Instead, you would say, well, that's a match for me. That doesn't sense sound polarity based, you see. Right. And when right. I joke around, now listen to this. We used to say um, ex-husband or ex-wife, okay? And then people started saying, well, my former wife. That sounded a little softer, kind of like a used car became a free <laughs> right? Right. Okay. So, so going from, you know, the ex-wife, which sounds kind of harsh, my former mm -hmm. wife. But what about my practice wife? <laughs> Isn't that hilarious? <laughs> it just sets the stage. It says, yeah. oh, my practice wife. No problem. That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, That's really so, funny. The, the the book is full of examples like that. Now that the practice wife thing is not in there. I saved that for live events because it's so funny. But um, <laughs> imagine that you could find words that would be descriptive of a situation that were mm -hmm. not polarity based. And whenever you find yourself using polarity words, and I gave I put a table in this book and actually you know ran the list. So um, um, what page is it on? Uh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Oh, I found it. 122. Yeah. I opened right to it. Yep. Is that it? Learn the language of the fifth dimension. Yep. Yep. Um, and also on page 120, there's words of power to replace your common language. But let's start with the table that you're looking at, 122. Um, right versus wrong, I see it as a choice. Um, the truth is, who's truth? Instead, you could say, what works for me? You know, well, mm -hmm. the truth of this is blah, blah, blah. Well, what works for me? Right. Um, mm -hmm. something, something isn't better. It's fascinating, interesting, or inviting. Um, you know, a lot of people have started using the word strange. This is really strange. You know, this is a really strange subject. And instead, you notice how that word has that connotation, the way you say it, strange. You don't just say, yeah. well, that's strange. You have to add that, you know, that tonality of, of, of that has that quality. So, um, I encourage people to give up strange or weird and in place put in interesting, unusual, curious, fascinating like that. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of words you can use that are helpful. And then um, a couple of page, a page earlier, um, instead of saying, I, I won't, you could say, I, or I can't rather, um, I can't do that. No, own it. You either won't do it or you don't know how, or you don't have a skill. Right. You know, how many people say, oh, I can't do that, when it when they're really trying to push it off. And that's yeah. hard for people. And, and the reason it's hard for people, and this is another funny story, um, why do mothers teach their children to lie? Are you ready for this? <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> mothers teach your their children to your lie. stories are the best. <laughs> When they tell, when they ask their kids a question, they already know the answer to. Did you do your homework? Did you eat all those cookies that were in a cookie jar? You know, did you make this mess? <laughs> Don't right. do that. Give it up. <laughs> Stop asking the questions because the child loves you and wants to give you something that'll make you happy. And when you say those things to them, all they can think of is, I got to deny it. So I got to lie. Right. And so we're teaching our kids to lie when we ask those mm -hmm. questions. Better yeah. to say, better to say, um, there's a mess in the kitchen. I think we need to clean it up. Could you come and help yeah. me? And then they'll come scampering because you didn't blame them. You know, one time. I usually ask them if they know who made it. I go, do you know who made this mess? <laughs> I don't even do that. You know, I do that. This is another good one, okay? Having raised a big family. Um, if you punish everybody for one event, they'll get on each other and you don't have to do it anymore, okay? Mm -hmm. So yeah. one time when we moved into a new house, I said, uh, I said, you know, there's, there's dishes in the family room, you know? You guys got to pick up your snacks so that, you know, it looks nice in here. Um and I did that for a couple of days and nothing changed. And of course, some people would say, well, you know, at least they're using plates. They're not just dragging their food in the family room. <laughs> so um, I said, okay, that's it. I'm, I'm laying down the law here. I've already done my job. I, it's not my job to clean up after you guys, uh, your snacks. 
So um, I'm going to start charging a quarter for every plate, every fork, every glass I find in the family when I go home from work. And um, since we don't know who did it, you're each going to give me a quarter. So I'm going to add a dollar for every plate I find. <laughs> I only collected money one day. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's a great one. So, That's know, a great parenting tip. And it, and it really makes sense because then you're not putting anybody on the spot. You're not making one a tattler for the other. Mm -hmm. You know, you're teaching them integrity to hold secrets that need to be held. And um, you are saying, all right, everybody in the kitchen, we're going to clean this mess up. And, and yeah. that's the way thing. You know, it's really that's amazing awesome. how that works. Um, and you, you also talk about emotions that hold you back, like resentment, fear, whining, self-righteousness, and denial. And resentment's like the energy of blame. So that ties into what you're saying, because, you know, when we come from a place of blame, you know, it's not serving anyone, really. You know, and as a parent, you, you go to blame because you want to try and train the one who's out of, out of touch with whatever they're supposed to be doing. But I believe that peer pressure is far more effective than <laughs> uh, parenting and trying to push that on the kids. So, um, you know, when there's more than one child, I, I really encourage them to work as a team to help each other. And even today, they prefer each other's company over anybody except their partner, you know, which is amazing to see grown men playing video games or chatting on the phone um, because they like their brother. They like their mm -hmm. partner with them. That so is awesome. Special. Mm -hmm. So we have a question actually from the audience from Jalisa Hall. She says, how can I internalize the concept of no more karma? Well, I'm glad you asked that. And it is a very challenging concept. And I will help you. It took me seven years from the time I was told there was no more karma. And I did start telling people. And when I would get asked, I would, they would say, well, what is, you know, how can that be? My typical answer was, I don't know. I just know that it's so. I haven't figured it out yet either. But um, I'll summarize it in a statement that came through me from Sana Kumara the Ascended Master Sana Kumara, and then I will give you some real-time examples. Mm -hmm. The Ascended Master Sana Kumara said, the game is over, referring to the three-day polarity game. The game is over. The game will end when there are no more players. Will you be mm -hmm. the first to leave or the last? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm out. I'm not going to be in that game. Now, what that means is I'm not keeping score on you and I'm not keeping score on me. And it doesn't mean that, that people aren't going to have, you know, like there's some pretty heavy duty crimes that are going on in the world or have gone on in the world. And certainly I'm not suggesting that they're not going to have to uh, be re-educated, for lack of a better word. But <clears throat> when I stop keeping score, on you it doesn't mean I'm not paying attention to what you're doing, but I stop keeping score on you. Everybody's stuck in one of those two places. They're either keeping score on themselves or they're keeping score on other people. And both of these are detrimental. And so the way to unhook from all of it is to look at it as a game. We've been playing this game for a long time to create experiences. We're, we've filled up the database. We don't need any more data. We've got enough data. We now get to move on to a new game with new rules, and the new rules don't require us to keep score because we're all playing like gentlemen. You know, my kids played a game called Ultima, which is a frisbee game. And when um, somebody bumped somebody or, you know, did some kind of a thing that would be called a foul, foul, the person who received the foul called it. You followed me. And then the other team had to accept that foul and, and you know, do something to help them, you know, like let them have the ball or help them have freeze frisbee or whatever. Well, when you're playing in gentlemen's roles and you have to allow someone to call you out, if you do something, everybody plays clean because they don't want to, they don't want to have a problem, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and this leads to a really big concept of not having to say you're sorry. So I hope, Julissa, I've answered your question about 
the karma game has ended and you can either stay in it and keep score on yourself or everybody else or you can say you know what it doesn't serve me anymore i don't need that i have enough good sense to know the right thing to do and when i look at somebody else and i think that's not fair they get to you know drive fast but i was going to take it give that up and just say you know what i'm choosing to drive the speed limit because i don't want to get a ticket period and i'm not keeping track of anybody else so what about not saying i'm sorry this is big <clears throat> When my kids were little, I taught them to say, instead of, I'm sorry, are you all right? Mm -hmm. Because when something happens that's an accident, you don't need to blame somebody. You just need to validate the problem. And so the validating of the problem is more effective than saying, I'm sorry, because the person is still suffering over their suffering. You know, like a, a, a little example would be, you know, walking down the airplane aisle. Once in a while, somebody has their foot step way out in the aisle because they think it's okay and nobody's walking in the aisle and they're asleep or maybe whatever. So then if you trip over them, do you expect them to say they're sorry? Wouldn't it be better if they said, are you okay? Because if they said, are you okay? Oh, yeah, I'm fine. You forget about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. Unless you're five, and then you'll say, no, I'm not okay. <laughs> exactly. And then the other thing is, when, let's say you do something to offend me, and now I'm hurt. Okay, now I, now I say, well, my friend Shereen has to apologize. Well, guess what? I put myself here, and I'm making you go down here. Mm -hmm. Okay? So when I insist that the other person should say they're sorry, what are we teaching them? This person is better than this person. Because if this person were as good as this person, they wouldn't have done it in the first place. Wow. Yeah, that's a really fascinating way to, to perceive that scenario. It's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. So yeah, many practical like tips here. Wow. You should write a book on parenting. <laughs> I have to use this paper recording to get all that stuff out. You know how it is. The, yeah. the people who are present and the uh, environment brings the that part of me out. And so I'm grateful to you. Uh, I'm so grateful that I got a chance to meet your children and how, how much fun they are, how cute oh. they are. You know, um, um, just speaking off the cuff for a Thank minute. Thank you. The um, when when I first told Cherry, should you come and say, "My oh no, I've got kids. You don't want to." No, no, I love kids. <laughs> I said, "You don't want me to bring my kids and my dog and <laughs> come stay with you." Yeah. Yep, and you were so gracious. You said, "No, how old are your kids? I love kids. Bring them in. Bring them anyways." That's awesome. Carol says, "New book: Waking Up in Five D Parenting." <laughs> <laughs> There you go. You got the title right there. <laughs> That's awesome. So thank you so much for your question, Jalisa. Oh, go ahead, Maureen. I would highly recommend is to develop a meditation practice. And if you're like me and have monkey mind, and it's, you know there's always something going on in your head, you know, doing a mindful meditation is nearly impossible. And you, you get so frustrated trying to do mindless, mindless, is that right? Mindfulness. Uh, <laughs> you can't do it, right? And right. So, it should be called mindless. Uh, right. Not mindful. <laughs> Mind empty. Yeah. My mind doesn't empty. It's always, it's always something <laughs> rushing in. It's like a, a playground with a ton, a ton of kids on that slide and nobody's making room for it, you know. Anyway, so, so. I recommend that you get my guided meditations. And I've got, I don't know, 20 or more guided meditations. And I spend a lot of time developing them. I write all the background music and the script, you know, is, is very well done. And if you, if you go to my blog and sign up to get the blog notices, you'll get announcements. And I, I don't know, it's probably been 10 years that I've given away a free meditation every single month. And so some of them are new and, you know, we're trying them out on you and we're letting you know that this is a beta. Some of them are on the store and we're just pulling it off the store and making it free this month. 
But every month you can get a free meditation on something. In fact, the, the free meditation that's going to go live probably tomorrow is um, it, uh, for the month of October, I should say, is a guided meditation that is a package and it takes people through soul retrieval. And soul retrieval is very oh, wow. beautiful and valid because you you um, you when you have a big trauma, a car accident, a sudden death of somebody in your family, some big trauma, you can almost always remember where you were when it happened. Like you remember when certain catastrophic events occurred. Like you remember when Princess died, you know, died or whatever it is. You remember yeah. where you were, and that. That has locked a piece of you in there. And so when they're more personal dramas and traumas, you could physically go back to that location and pull back your lost parts and bring them in. But this process does that for you. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's a fun, you know, like three parts to it. And you it's just follow the instructions. It's follow along. That's why they call me the practical mystic. I'm always looking for easy ways to do this. Right. And, and I was given this information when my younger sister passed away unexpectedly in a car crash and she was mm. uh, living in France and uh, was married to a Frenchman and had a family. And <clears throat> it was awful, you know, and, and every place I went until I got to Paris, you know, telling the story and blah, blah, blah. And then my guides gave me this protocol. And there was one person that was with me when I got the news and that person particularly called me pretty regularly to um, um, check on me. Mm -hmm. And after I was given the protocol and I followed it, he called me and he said, how are you doing today? And I, I don't know, remember what I said. I think I said, I feel all together. And he said, you sound all together. And it was literally all my lost parts from each time I told the story and it was, upset and, and there was all kinds of drama you know like i wasn't traveling with my passport in those years now i do um i had to have one of my sons go to my house into the lockbox drive it to another city where they could get it to an airline stewardess who care hand carried it to another city and then they couldn't find it you know i could go on and on it all turned out well well yeah. yeah, we get fragmented. Um, you know, our souls literally leave pieces behind, especially as children when we have those traumatic um, experiences as children. So soul retrieval is a huge important healing tool that's available to everyone. So that's awesome that you have a meditation uh, coming out this week. Are they about 30 minutes long, 20 minutes long. How long are your meditations typically? Well, this particular product is um, two, two specific meditations. One meditation you do when you go to bed. You put it on right before you crawl in bed. And that's maybe 10 minutes long. And then the next morning you do a ceremony to bring all your lost parts back and wash them and bring them in. And so there's a, a very short uh explanation of what you're going to do that's like the intro to all of that and then you do that meditation mm -hmm. at night and then in the morning there's another meditation that you do that's probably 10 or 20 minutes long i don't remember but you also if you know the Merkaba, i ask people to do that as well as part mm -hmm. of the integration right wow that sounds really powerful i love the idea of a nighttime meditation because again you know, it's all about intention. And so when you're setting that intention at night before you go to sleep, it's beautiful. You're going to have a safer journey into the astral or wherever you're going um, that night. And also, um, you know, trying to do that protocol first thing in the morning is great if you can do it. Mm -hmm. And it's so wonderful that you're offering these up on your blog for free. So everyone go check out Maureen's website. Um, MaureenStGermain.com and sign up for her blog. That's wonderful. And you have those great little card USB drive cards that you gave me. Yeah. <laughs> There's meditations on there too. Yes, I am going to be in Marlboro, Massachusetts in November for that event. Um, 
I'm going to be on the big screen in New York. I'm not going to go back to New York for the New York uh, Natural Life Expo, but mm -hmm. I will be present with a presentation. And what, what's, the, what's the event in Massachusetts? I'm sorry. It's called uh, uh, Conscious Life Living. Um, the uh, sponsor is a magazine called Spirit of Change. So if you go to Spirit of Change website, you should be able to find the link. Um, okay. Wonderful. And it's November 15th, something like that. Um, okay, so wonderful. Like, oh, oh, thank you. Thank you so much for your sweet comments. I really appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> There's a lot of great comments in here. I'm trying to trying to put some of them up on the screen to share with you, Maureen. Thank you. Um, Jalisa says, I'm so thankful I don't need to keep score any longer. <laughs> yes, you answered your her question. Yes. So that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, Brandon has a question. This is kind of a long one. And I hope, I okay, so, uh, so I'm getting through most of the be a genie, but the more I try to work with my own manifestation and the quantum field, and this information, the more doubts I have about myself, even though in my heart, I know in my heart, I'm capable of doing this. I'm trying to figure out my blocks, but I feel stuck. And okay. Maybe it is affecting my genie movie manifestation. Okay. Or maybe I'm so, so worrying about it. So first of all, um, I'd like <laughs> to thank you for sharing that question. That's a great question. Yeah. I'm actually going to be teaching a class on uh, manifestation um, very soon using the material in Be a Genie. And one of the things I will say to you, Brandon, if you haven't really gotten your arms around the Phoenix sequence, it might be difficult. But one of the things that happens once you understand the Phoenix sequence, and the Phoenix sequence is similar to the Fibonacci sequence, except that the Phoenix sequence, this is so, so cool, is, how should I put it? Lots of you have heard of the uh, Fibonacci sequence, and the Fibonacci sequence is built upon itself. So one zero is one, two and one are three, three and two are five, five and three are eight. And so if you write them out, it's zero, one, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen, twenty-one, thirty-four, fifty-five, 13, 21, 34, 55, like that. And so each number that shows up as a new number on the sequence is the previous number and the partner before. So any pair tells you the next number. Any adjacent pair on that sequence will give you the next number. Hmm. Phoenix sequence says you can start with any two numbers, not just the Fibonacci sequence. And that's not widely known. And it's a mathematical principle that I came across. It, it certainly is not new information but no one ever named it. So I named it the Phoenix Sequence and referred to it as the Phoenix Sequence and other authors, authors have also used it and called it the Phoenix Sequence. Okay, so <clears throat> the Phoenix Sequence says you could start with any two numbers, five and 56, and then you add them together and that would be 61, right? Five, 50, 56 and five is 61. And then the next number would be 56 and 61 added like that and over nine iterations, the ninth and 10th iteration divided will always produce phi. And phi is that magical relationship that exists throughout the planet, throughout all of life that shows up in our bones, in our DNA, in um, design work and the relationship between sun and Mercury and Mars. So this magical relationship called phi is found everywhere and now you know how phi gets created by right? two things that are paired together and so once you understand that then you could take and your manifestation is here i'm going to put that in the middle and your you are here so let's just use a, a, a typical manifestation you're single over here and you want to be coupled you want to be partnered over here so most people are vibrating between those two okay but what if you gave up that example and instead of choosing i'm going to use my bottle here as oh no that's not tall enough 
All right, I'll use a feather. So now we're gonna make the heart's desire. You're with your partner over in the middle and you're over here with your, where you're at, you're single. But what comes after that that proves this occurred? And so then you use the math to help you understand that any two numbers that are paired together over a sequence will produce phi, phi is source code for creation. So now what, what the math is telling you is not that you have to have faith in yourself or believe in yourself. It's saying if you do these two things, you will for sure manifest your heart's desire. So in an example of the, of the um, beloved, what comes after you're partnered? And the answer is you're celebrating some kind of anniversary. The anniversary that you just met, the anniversary you moved in together, the anniversary you got married, whatever it is, you're celebrating. And that celebration is what you hold in your heart as the manifestation. And you also don't offer any resistance to the initial thing that I'm single. That means you find happiness being single, and then you have happiness in your heart and mind when you imagine your beloved. And you do three things in that manifestation. And they are, number one, um, you align with uh, third dimension. And third dimension requires interaction. So you have what I will call a real-time conversation with the beloved. So if you're a hetero and you're a female, you want to have a conversation with a man. And so you see a faceless face, but you know he's male. Okay? And that's where you start. And then you imagine that person talking to you and you're talking to them. And you're celebrating, clinking glasses. I'm so happy we're together. I'm so happy we have made it this far. I'm so grateful that I'm with you. All of those yummy things produce the middle outcome, which is we got together. Mm -hmm. So those three things are literally the three dimensions. So the, the first one is third dimension, physical manifestation, which is you hearing your voice say it. Uh, fourth dimension is the emotion that starts to happen as you hear those words. And then fifth is the joy that you find yourself in as a result. And it, it's there's no uh, anger. It's only joy filled. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, if you, um, well, you know, Cherie is, I'm going to make one up for you, Cherie. She's okay. going to a new home. <laughs> And she's got a lot on her plate. She's probably got to pull a pile of stuff out of storage and move everything to Arizona. Okay. I'm outing you. <laughs> you are outing me. <laughs> <laughs> what proves that it all went smoothly? You know, mm -hmm. the loan, the, the, um, the banking, the, the move, the family. What proves that it all worked out? Do you know me? Yeah. Um, I would say when, like the intention, like that once we get there and everyone is happy, right? Well, that that's what most people do. They go to the middle, okay? But you want to go beyond that place where everyone's happy. And that means that you would, uh, maybe you'd have your family or your husband's family come for a visit. And they're so impressed with your beautiful home and how well you've decorated and how happy everyone is. That proves that it all came together smoothly. So you're saying you need a witness. The wit that's the real-time conversation. Absolutely. Uh -huh. You always need that that real-time witness to the conversation. And if you're seeking a beloved, you would imagine it's the beloved. But if it's something, uh, let's say you want to manifest a car, for example, as another yeah. way to look at it. Okay, so um, how am I going to establish that it really occurred? What event proves that the car and I have come together? And the answer right. is somebody sees me in the car. <laughs> That's true. Okay. Otherwise, it could just be your imagination. Right. So, so yeah. anchor that in. Now, now let's let's just say you are looking for a second car. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have a second car, but anyway, um, you go to the grocery store, and in your new vehicle, 
and somebody that you know who shops at the same store sees you and they say, oh, I didn't recognize you in that car. Whose car is that? And you could say, that's my car. I just got another car. Now, when you say that to yourself, I mean, you're, you're hearing yourself say it to the friend, okay? What happens is your mind shifts and you, ah, it feels different. And you've given yourself permission. Because sometimes what happens is when we have a heart's desire, no matter what it is, when we want it, we go to that place that's right before it. And, you know, we keep, we're in that wishing and hoping. Mm-hmm. And when you go to in manifestation work, not in intention work, but in manifestation work, you are literally choosing, in the way I teach manifestation, you're really choosing to go beyond the, the moment of your heart's desire mm-hmm. to a moment that allows you to look in the past and say, that happened. Or, you know, you look for a great vacation. What is proof that you went on a great vacation? What yeah. is the proof? What would it be? You had a great time. You showed everyone the pictures. Yeah. And <laughs> the so pictures. The, the movie, the mind, the movie yeah. the mind, is you're showing one person your pictures and telling yeah. them stories. And then you hear that person say, that is so cool. We should do that, or I should do that, or I mm-hmm. wish I was with you, whatever it was. But you hear them say something. Now, here's something amazing that happens in this genie work. When you do this, and you, and you really get into it, over time, you will hear something that you did not script. So, um, you know, let's take the, the car scenario. You hear your friend say, well, where did, you know, I didn't recognize you in that car. You know, you drive in somebody else's car. No, that's my car. And then they say something like, you know, I always saw you driving a Beamer. And you <laughs> I didn't put that in the script, but you hear it in your head. Yeah. Okay? That's proof to you that the universe is already on it. The order has been turned into the kitchen and it's coming. Mm-hmm. Isn't that right. fabulous? That is fabulous. It reminds me a little bit of getting married. So... Before you get married, you could be with your partner for eight, 10 years. But the minute you get married and you have those witnesses at your wedding, right? Which is why they invite people to witness and they even call them witnesses. It it shifts and it becomes like this official thing. And then it's like everyone sees you as together in unity, you know? And then your family showers you with gifts usually (laughs) like big gifts. So, but they wait until you get married to make it, to make those offers because it's like they they're witnessing this new union, which is, you know, it's like we have our individual selves, but then we come together and there's like a soul or a spirit of that relationship as well. So it's kind of interesting um, concept that you're talking about here. It yeah, it's, me of all, that. it's all in the book, Be a Genie, and it's a wonderful book. Um, awesome. I will have to check that out. Yeah, it's funny. It's it's a not only is it a fun book, but it's funny. I wrote some funny stories in there. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, wow. So you're going to be in Massachusetts. We're already coming up on um, two hours here, Maureen. It's gone by so quickly. So you guys, if you're, um, you know, dying to get any questions into Maureen, this would be the time to put them in the chat room. Please don't be shy. And um, if you could share with us, Maureen, where people can find you or what you have coming up. I think you mentioned another book that you're yes. writing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, this Well, we're in edits right now. So the book is done, but we're just, you know, doing edit stuff. It'll come out next spring and it's called Mastering Your 5D Self. And it's a no. follow-up to um, waking up in 5D with more information and more cool stuff. Um, to, awesome. Uh, more, 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 more cool stuff. You know, I'm constantly getting more and more information. And I, I want to say, you know, um, in 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 uh, what's coming up is uh, trainings that we're doing, and mm-hmm. next spring 
uh, one of the reasons I moved to Arizona was to uh, make a school more official than what I've been doing. I've been teaching online, you know, and working with people. And so we're setting up a school. And for example, last month we had our first outside teacher who was teaching the Tarot. She's one of my students, which is also um, a master in Tarot. And so that class went very well. We had very good attendance. And I'm going to be offering more of a variety of classes, not just this, this Ascension work. And the variety of classes that help us, help each of us, you know, understand our days and make more of our, get more value out of our day and out of our opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, so that's coming up to spring. Um, let's see, we are, uh, we are in the process of, of rebranding. So, you know, we're looking for a good artist who can, you know, work with us and um, help us, you know, bring all the little brands together because we have the Akashic Records brand and we have the um, Transformational Enterprises brand and we have the Ascension Institute brand. So those are all really cool things. Um, I do teach an annual program that's uh, offered once a year. And, you know, we start taking applications in the spring, uh, work with people for a commitment for a year in the fall. Um, mm -hmm. We also are uh, have offered classes on sacred geometry. We have another class coming up in December on sacred geometry. And um, there's lots going on, you know. Um, yeah. Back in China in December, so I'll be back there teaching again. And this is all on Zoom. This is not in person. We're waiting for that to open up, you know. Right. The, the China classes in Zoom. Uh -huh. Awesome. And then you've also got um, this beautiful line of essential oils that you started making called the Orion series. Well, now they're called the Orion series. And I happened to get two of these while I was visiting with Maureen. Where's my camera? I got the Akashic, the Akashic Access and the Inner Guru. And you guys can get these on Maureen's site or also on the Vibram with Vibrance website. Is that right, Maureen? Yeah. Yeah. And we sell them on our website and we are offering a special deal on the blend that goes with the soul retrieval. And I think it's called elation, if I'm not mistaken. And elation is a very powerful blend because it helps you really bring in that soul retrieval. And one of the new things we have coming out is uh, cards that go with the blends. So we have um, oh, cool. a card like this. These are not cut properly, but you know, I just mm -hmm. print them out and, you know, do some paper cutter. And one of the things I put with these then is a clearing statement to use with our intention disc. And the clearing statement helps you clear emotional wounds. So on this one, for example, angels who are here to help assist me in removing blockages, fear, resentment, and laziness. I am empowered with their help and move forward with grace and ease. And so... Um, we have one for each of the blends and that's, that's awesome product that's coming out this weekend. And as a matter of fact, on Saturday, um, we have a training that we're doing. Um, nice work, Brandon. Um, <laughs> we have a training coming up this uh, Saturday and I will be speaking about the blends and how they work and, and why they're so important. And, and one of the things that, um, you know, for 12 years when we, when we you know, produce these and sell them all over the world, you know, they, they were really helping people with their emotional stuff. And there's a great story about a guy, a, a lady who was an attorney who had a session and her record keeper said to her, you know, she should get this blend. And after the session, I said, well, I happen to have that particular blend if you're interested. And she says, no, I, you know, I don't really believe in essential oils. I don't think so. And I said, well, it's fine with me. I don't really care. And as soon as I shrugged my shoulders, she said, well, in that case, I'll get it. I guess she was <laughs> thinking that I was going to try and push it. And I'm thinking, whatever, you know. And, People are funny. And so she bought it. And she opened it on a city bus in Manhattan. And, you know, put it on her palms, you know, and rubbed it together and inhaled. That's the way you're supposed to do it. And mm -hmm. the man sitting in front of her turned around and looked her in the eye and said, thank you. I don't know what you just did, but I know it came from you. And I feel so much better. Wow. That That's awesome. Um, that is. And so then when I partnered with the Vibrance Company, what what happened is they decided to do testing. 
and they did um, scientific testing where they tested DNA rewinding and how fast something would, you know, recover to its normal state of being tightly wound. And also they did mm -hmm. blood microscopy. And I was astounded at the results. And all that will be revealed in the presentation this weekend. And we also will put some of that information on the website so you can look that up. And so in addition to me, you know, like believing in them and, and you know, accepting the fact that they came through Mary Magdalene to the, the master blender that worked with me, um, we now have scientific proof of how awesome they are. And, and I want to say one other thing about the blends, and that is I did not intend to do this work in, with the blends. It was not on my agenda. It wasn't about I wasn't even into the blend. I wasn't even into essential oils. And the lady who was working for me um, as a staff member was had her master's degree in uh, natural health and uh, 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 with the minor in essential oils. And it was her second mm -hmm. series of degrees because she was already a legal um, legal aid or legal research. I don't remember what the title was, but, you know, already had a lot of professional experience and went back and did this. And these blends were coming through in the dream time and they had, they were all related to my stuff, my CDs, my classes, my books. And at the time, it didn't occur to me that they came through for me and the work I was doing. Mm -hmm. so it wasn't until... We, we, um, the, this lady retired for the third time from me. I mean, not, she didn't retire three times a year, but she'd been retired different times, you know, and I was the third time mm -hmm. uh, that, that, it, that I asked, you know, what do we do with the oils? And, you know, I was told that I was the, the mother of the oils and that the other person was the surrogate and that they had always been for me and they were always connected with me. And that had not occurred to me. Wow. What a story. That's incredible. <laughs> so they're really a beautiful way to, yeah, for them to come through. Yeah. And they smell so good. This one I just put on is Inner Guru, and it smells really nice. Well, <sighs> it's very uplifting. Joke. If, it's, if it smells really bad and you don't like it, you probably need it even more. <laughs> oh really? Yeah. Oh, that's good to know. Well, that's funny. That I I haven't smelled one that I've disliked, but I like this one better than the Akashic Records. Yeah. So maybe I'll uh, one I more. Tell you is that it goes right to the limbic system, bypasses the brain, and yeah. impacts you in a very subtle way. And when we mm -hmm. can see the results on the my blood microscopy within a few seconds, it was mind-boggling. Yeah. Yeah, I always tell people that with my essential oils, like this is the fastest way to healing because it goes right to the brain, you know, through the olfactory system in 30 seconds, you get the healing. Your body knows what to do with it because everything is energy and it's in the in the Akashic records, right? So it knows how to access the information through an energetic channel. It's pretty, pretty amazing. It is pretty amazing. Yeah. Pretty amazing. So... Um, since we're here at the, the two hour mark, I would love to ask you one last question. And that would be, what would you advise to people right now as we're going through this ascension? Um, if there's one thing they can take away tonight, what can, what would you like to share with everyone about this ascension we're in right now and what phase we're in, in this shift? We are in the phase where you're going to pass. You're going to pass. You might, get a, you might get an A, you might get a B, you might get a C, but you are going to pass. You're going to make it. We're all going to make it. If you're listening to this, you're going to make it. And the fastest way to maintain that is to ask for a day of heaven on earth for yourself, everyone you come in contact with, and everyone you're in contact with. And that ensures that you are vibing in a way that supports the people around you and the people that you need to interact with. Mm -hmm. And now you are making a difference. Beautiful. I love that. So simple. You've got so many great simple tips. I want to put them all up and so I don't forget. <laughs>
<laughs> ask for a day of heaven on earth and ask for it before you go to sleep too. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. I just love chatting with you because it always feels so natural and flowy and, you know, we bring out really good information that I think people uh, want to hear. So that's always fun. And um, everyone in the chat room, thanks for hanging in there with us. If you're still watching this video, please don't forget to like this video if you've enjoyed it tonight. And if you're new to my channel, please subscribe. Um, I would love to share more content with you. There is another video of Maureen that you can watch from about, I think, 2018. So maybe three years ago. It's up on the featured videos right now. So you can't miss it. So that would be awesome. And Maureen, I'd love to have you back on the show sometime as you, I know you're always putting stuff out and you've always got new information. So, and always have great stories to share. So I'd love to have you back on. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. And it's so much fun, um, you know, to, to talk with you and open up that channel of wisdom that comes through. Mm, thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, everyone, please don't forget to go check out Maureen's channel at MaureenStGermain.com. Uh, I'm sorry, her website. And she also has a channel on YouTube. Is it just YouTube.com slash Maureen St. Germain, your YouTube channel? No, I, I don't know the answer to that. I do know. <laughs> okay. I do know that if you are on YouTube and you type in Maureen St. Germain, it comes right up. Right. Okay. Yes. And it's also on your website. So if people go on your website, there's a link to it right in the upper right hand corner. So not hard to find. So wonderful. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, this has been a great show and it's been a great night. And I loved all your questions. And Jalisa says, wow, thank you. <laughs> so I think she was referring to your last statement about asking for heaven on earth. That was beautiful. All right, everyone, please also check out um, our Telegram channel. If you get a chance, please join. We can continue the conversation in there. And you can also follow us on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. And I also have um, a website, shariariano.com. If you're interested, go check it out. I make healing tools on there that I offer. And for all of my Ascension Session followers, you automatically get 10% off with the code HEALME10 or HEAL10 rather. So um, please take a look at that when you get a chance. And thank you again so much for being here. Have a wonderful night and thank you, Maureen. My pleasure.